كتاب الله دستوري وخير الخلق أسوتنا لسنته جلا نوري لهدي الحق أرشدنا كتاب الله دستوري وخير الخلق أسوتنا لسنته جلا نوري لهدي الحق أرشدنا كتاب الله دستوري وخير الخلق أسوتنا بسنته جلا نوري لهدي الحق إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون It begins this, this way the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put all your enemies under your feet. And so that's what David writes. And so Jesus said, well, if the Messiah is David's son, how can David also call him his Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, who do you think the second Lord is? That's the Messiah. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus. My dear respected brothers and sisters and non-Muslim guests, first and foremost, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and earth, the master, the sustainer, the king of kings, the most gracious, the most merciful. And we send our prayers and blessings upon our beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions, and those who follow in righteousness until the final day. I welcome you all with the Islamic greetings of Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, which means may the peace, mercy, and blessings upon Almighty God be upon you all. Insha'Allah, I, Muhammad Halabi, will be the master conductor of tonight's debate. Before we start the debate, we shall begin with the recitation of the Quran. I would like to introduce and call up our Qari for tonight, our reciter, Sheikh Ahmed al zukum to come to the stage and recite some Quran for us. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wadhkur fi al-kitab maryam إذ تبذت من أهلها مكانا شرقيا فاتخذت من دونهم حجابا فأرسلنا فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال إن رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما لأهب لك غلاما زكيا قالت أنا يكون لي ولد ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هين 
ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة منا ورحمة منا وكان أمرا مقضيا فحملته فانتبذت به مكانا قصيا فأجاء أهل مخاض إلى جذع النخلة قالت قالت يا ليتني مت قبل هذا وكنت نسيا منسيا فناداها من تحتها ألا تحزني قد جعل ربك تحتك سريا وهزي إليك بجذع النخلة تساقط عليك رطبا جنيا فكلي واشربي وقري عينا فإما ترين من البشر أحدا فقولي فقولي إني نذرت للرحمن صوما فلن أكلم اليوم إنسيا فأتت به قومها تحمله قالوا يا مريم لقد جئت شيئا فريا يا أخت هارون ما كان أبوك مرأ سوء وما كانت أمك بغيا فأشارت إليه قالوا كيف نكلم من كان في المهد صبيا قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعلني جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون ما كان لله أن يتخذ من ولد سبحانه سبحانه إذا قضى أمرا إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون. Now I'll just translate what um, our Sheikh has recited. He's recited from uh, from chapter Maryam, which is the the chapter dedicated to Mary, verses 16 to 35. And mention, O Muhammad, in the book, The Story of Mary, when she, withdraw, when she withdrew from her family to a place towards the east, and she took in seclusion from them a screen. Then we sent to her an angel, and he represented himself as a well-proportioned man. She said, indeed, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you, so leave me if you should be fearing of God. He said, I am only a messenger 
of your Lord to give you news of a pure boy. He said, how, she said, how can I have a boy while no man has touched me and I have not been unchaste? He said, thus it will be. Your Lord says it is easy for me and we will make him a sign to the people and a mercy from us and it is a matter already decreed. So she conceived him and she withdrew with him in a remote place. And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk to, of a palm tree. She said, oh, I wish I had died before this and was oblivion, forgotten. But he called her and blew, and be, be, he called her from below her. Do not grieve, your Lord has prov provided you beneath you a stream and shake towards the trunk of the palm tree and it will drop upon you ripe fresh dates. So eat and drink and be contented. And if you see from among humanity anyone, indeed I have vowed to the most merciful, so I may not speak of to any man. Then she, brought to, then she brought him to the people carrying him. They said, O Mary, you have certainly done a thing unpredicted and a sister of Harun or Aaron. Your father was not a man of evil, nor was your man, mother unchaste. So she pointed to him. They said, how can we speak to the one who was in the cradle, a child? Jesus, peace be upon him, said, indeed I am, indeed I am a servant of God. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. And he has made me blessed wherever I am and has enjoyed upon me prayer and charity as long as I remain alive, and made me dutiful to my mother, and he has not made me a, rich, a wretched tyrant. And peace be upon me the day I was born, the day I shall die, and the day I am raised alive. That is Jesus, the son of Mary, the word of truth about which they are, dis they are in dispute. It is not befitting for God to take a son, exalted he is, when he decrees an affair, he only says, be, and it is. Dear, dear respected brothers and sisters and non-Muslim guests, the present world is experiencing a lot of conflict, clashes in the name of religion. Hearts have been broken in the name of religion, which is supposed to bring us together. At this, at this junction in time, in order to bridge the gap between religious functions we have organized this debate today. Our hearts and condolences go out to the families of the victims in the tragic events that have recently occurred in Christchurch, New Zealand and in Sri Lanka. If I can get both speakers to come together and show solidarity against such hate and violence and a gesture of peace. Terrible tragedies, terrible things that people do to one another. Uh, we have a God who says you shall not murder. Uh, we have a God who says truth is important. We have a God who also says how we conduct ourselves is important. Uh, so vital to speak the truth in love, so vital to, uh, to say what we believe is true and do it in a good spirit. And I, uh, yeah, it, as I say, just appalling things happen when people go against the law of God, the God who says you shall not murder, and uh, it just grieves the heart that such things could take place, and it's good to have you with us here, and, and well, you to have me here, <laughs> and uh, yeah, to join with you in this against uh, murder and barbaric treatment of other people you know. thank you for that thank you um, you know just a few words uh, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I start alhamdulillah rabbil alameen um, we've all been aware and we have just come out of the tragedy that we saw 
um, in the mosque attacks that happened in New Zealand, and it was, you know, sort of an extra wound on top of that to see the churches being attacked in Sri Lanka. So as a Muslim, and I'm sure our Reverend Dr. Peter here, as a Muslim and Christian, we stand together in support of each other, shoulder to shoulder against all forms of hate, violence, and terrorism that rips apart our society, our community, our, so our, our, our religious groups, our faiths. So whoever has done that, whoever has done the attacks on the mosque in, in New Zealand, or those who have done the attacks in Sri Lanka on the churches, these are cowards, and these are people who do not represent any group, any faith, any religion. So you know, we, as, as Australians here, we stand together, we pass on our condolences to each other, and we pass our condolences to our Sri Lankan community here in Australia, and to all the victims and their families in New Zealand and in Sri Lanka. May God bring peace, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring peace and bring sanity within our hearts and within our societies. The purpose of this event is to bring two major religious communities on a common platform of communication, thus opening doors of understanding and knowing each other's perspective. One has to agree, Muslims and Christians do have different beliefs and faiths, but our differences shall not hinder healthy discussions in a peaceful manner. And thus, we shall, we shall be able to live in peace without the fear factor. To our non-Muslim guests here tonight, the statement, Allahu Akbar, an Arabic phrase which means God is the greatest, is often used by Muslims in times of praise, excitement, and passion. So please do not be worried if someone praises out loudly by saying, Allahu Akbar. I assure you, you are all safe here tonight by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, before I introduce our speakers for tonight, I would like to talk about the organizers of this event, IREA, the Islamic Research and Educational Academy. IREA is a non-profit non educational academy here in Australia. The vision and mission of IREA is to implore Islam in the right perspective to both Muslims and non-Muslims alike by conducting as well as participating in public lectures, public interactive sessions, inter-religious inter dialogues, and having discussions with active members and renowned scholars of different religions. The primary focus of IREA is clarifying misconceptions of Islam by presenting, explaining, or answering allegations against Islam by using logic, reasoning, Islamic understanding, scientific understandings, and comparative religion. At any opportunity, IREA tries to set an example of a civilized, tolerant, and educative Islamic society. Mostly by, the organizing, mostly by organizing events of academic arguments of different faiths and beliefs, which are publicly discussed in the most disciplined environment and on the single platform, which is shared by the representatives of different communities in a set, in a set format and an organized decorum. I would like to remind all my Muslim brothers and sisters that we should be grateful to Almighty God for making us Australians to which the law of the land permits such academic opportunities. I'll read the format of this debate once again. The first speaker, Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes, will speak for 20 minutes on the topic advertised. Then the second speaker, Brother Wasim Razvi, will also speak for 20 minutes on the topic advertised. After the speeches, both speakers will, will be, a, there will be a rebuttal session. The first rebuttal will be given by Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes for 10 minutes, followed by a rebuttal by Brother Wasim Razvi for 10 minutes. Then before the question and answer session, between the audience and speakers, there will be a project launch and a time to prepare for Q&A. Questions and answers then we'll go through the question and answers. Conducting remarks by both speakers will have three minutes to answer each question. Then we shall, have, then we shall be having a question, a question and answer session 
where the audience will be given a chance to pose questions to both speakers. And then we'll be praying jama'ah at 9 o'clock after the events, insha'Allah. Now, I would like to introduce our Christian speaker for tonight. Reverend Dr. Peter Buns, on my right, is a pastor for the Rivesby Presbyterian Church in Sydney and lectures part-time in church history in Christ College, Burwood. He has authored in a number of books, Abortion and the books are Abortion and the Christian. Both sides now, Lamp Unto My Feet and Theological Controversies in the Presbyterian Church of New South Wales. Teaching and preaching duties have taken him to India, Mainama, Nepal and Vanuatu. He is married to Lynn. They have six grown, six grown up children and nine grandchildren with another two on the way. He had a number of intermittent debates with Muslims over the years and he is currently working on a book in a dialogue form with a Muslim in Australia which is almost, fin which is almost finished and hope to be useful to both Muslims and Christians. Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, for the introduction, and for all the organisation that's uh, gone into this. Uh, it's good to give thanks uh, to, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, Christians and Muslims believe that there is one God, and he is the creator, and he is the judge, and the, the topic tonight is Jesus. Uh, is he the God-man, or is he... Uh, God's servant. We, what we believe about Jesus uh, needs to be accurate. We, we both believe that. And I want to begin with the teaching of Jesus uh, as the Messiah. Well, first of all, what does the Quran and what does the Bible say about this title Messiah? Messiah is a title, it's not a name. Uh, the Quran in Surah 3 and verse 45 says that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. Christ is the Greek word, Messiah, uh, anglicised from uh, Hebrew. And the New Testament, of course, everywhere declares that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. But we have to then define what is Messiah? What, what do we mean by saying that Jesus is the Messiah? Uh, it's not an obvious title to any of us, I wouldn't think. Uh, and we want to uh, use reason uh, the Bible says, come, let us reason together. Uh, this is from the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 1. And the, the Quran would say the same thing. Uh, the word Christ, which is Greek, or Messiah, Hebrew, means anointed one. Uh, so let's seek out what this means. Uh, so we, we have both holy texts saying that Jesus is the, is the Messiah. When you go to the Old Testament... Prophets are anointed, they are anointed with oil, and priests are anointed, and kings are anointed. So they're the three great groups that are anointed with oil uh, to signify uh, their authority. Jesus, of course, is not anointed with oil, he's anointed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so there's a difference. Uh, one is a shadow of the other. The Old Testament is a shadow of greater things to come, uh, when Jesus comes, he is that greater one who has come. Uh, let's also look at what the Quran says in looking at the Torah and the Injil. Uh, I'm, I'm reading from Surah 3 and verse 3. It is he who has sent down the book, meaning the Quran, to you, Muhammad, with truth, confirming what came before it. And he sent down the Torah, the, the Torah, and the Angel, you know, the Gospel. So there's a confirming emphasis there. Uh, so the Quran says that Jesus is the Christ. The Old Testament says there is a, a Christ, a Messiah, coming. And the Quran says that uh, it confirms what went before. That's chapter Surah 3. But also in uh, Surah 5 and verse 46, 
Uh, in their footsteps, we sent Isa, Jesus, son of Miriam, that's Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him, and we gave him the Injil, in which was guidance and light and confirmation of the Torah that had come before it, a guidance and an admonition uh, for the pious. And so again, the key word is confirm, a continuity, one thing pointing to another and, and not changing uh, that other, uh, not in, in a dissonance with the other, but uh, pointing clearly to that other and that is what we believe about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, so far we've seen that the Quran calls Jesus the Messiah and it tells us that we need to go back to the Torah, to the Old Testament and to the, the New Testament, to the injury of the Gospels, in order to see what this is all about. Now, I'm going to show here, uh, to begin with, two texts from the Old Testament. Uh, that's not the right one. <laughs> You've got Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is from the Old Testament. Anyway, I'll press on. Uh, the Old Testament prophesies the coming of the Messiah. Uh, and so here is the Old Testament. Now, the Quran says this will confirm the truth. So it, the Quran says it confirms the Torah. Uh, now, I know there's often the claim that this has been corrupted, but can I say this? Concerning the Old Testament, uh, it's fairly obvious it can't be corrupted. Uh, who did it? No answer. How could you do it? Well, no answer there either. Uh, why? Why would you corrupt the Old Testament when the Jews hold to the Old Testament but they do not believe that Jesus is the Christ? The Quran says Jesus is the Christ. The New Testament says Jesus is the Christ. Uh, the Jews, as a, a religious faith, I'm not talking about nationality, but faith, religious faith, do not believe, by definition, that Jesus is the Christ. But look at what Psalm 2 says about the coming Messiah, the Anointed One. It begins by saying that the kings of the earth uh, and the rulers are taking counsel together ag against the Lord, against Yahweh, the I am who I am, and his anointed, that's his Messiah. So this begins with rebellion against God and his Messiah. And they want to be free from this rule. You see that in verse 3? Uh, and then there's a response by God to that in this psalm. Uh, so the Lord in heaven, uh, he laughs. These people are shaking their fist at God. Uh, these finite beings, sinful human beings, re in rebellion against uh, the law of God, the, the word of God, the rule of God over their lives. Uh, they want to do their own thing. They want to go their own way. And he who sits in the heaven laughs. Now, he, he's, he's not amused. <laughs> it's a laughter of derision. And he is angry. And he says this, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, uh, Jerusalem, my holy hill. That's verse 6. And the decree is fixed, meaning uh, the plan must be carried out. And it doesn't matter whether the world wants to vote out this plan of God. It, it cannot do so. Uh, so they can shake their fist all, all they like at God. It's like the, the mouse you're trying to take on the elephant. That's not a, a silly enough picture illustration. Uh, it, these human beings rebelling against God must fail. God's kingdom is worldwide, the Messiah's kingdom is worldwide. He's not simply the Messiah of the Jews. He's Messiah of the whole world. That's verse 8. The ends of the earth will be this king's possession. And to mutiny against him is the height of folly. That's verse 9. And so this is the Messiah according to Psalm 2. He's the king of all the earth, not just of Israel. Be wise, says verses 10 through to 12. Uh, look, look, at the, uh, look at the verbs there. Know who will win. Uh, it won't be the unbeliever. 
Be wise, be warned, serve the Lord, rejoice with trembling, kiss the sun, embrace the sun, realise who he is and come to him. So there's Psalm 2. Jesus is not mentioned, of course. This is Old Testament. The author of Psalm 2 is not given there, but if it is David, that would be 1000 BC, thereabouts. The, the one who is God's anointed is called Messiah. That's what, that's what anointed means. That's verse 2. He's called king in verse 6. And he's called son, son of God, in verse 7 and verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. So just keep that in, in mind. That's, that's Psalm 2. And I want to now turn to Daniel chapter 9, which is not the easiest text in the whole of the Old Testament, but it, it's prophesies the coming of the Messiah. And uh, it says uh, 70 weeks or 77s are decreed about your people and your holy city and then six things will be accomplished to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit and to anoint the most holy place. And then if you go down to this uh, 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 section there in verse 25 about the timing of all this, uh, I will come back briefly to mention that, but look at verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one, a Messiah, uh, he shall be cut off, which means he'll be put to death, and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city, it's Jerusalem that's been spoken of, and the sanctuary, the temple. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end that there shall be war, desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and uh, offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Now, some of that is, if you've just heard that for the first time, uh, it's double Dutch, and we use that expression, triple Hebrew, whatever, and it's not easy to follow. But some things are clear. The timing is roughly clear from the time uh, when the going forth of the word to rebuild Jerusalem uh, to the coming of the Messiah will be seven sevens plus 62 sevens or weeks. So it's roughly, if you take it as a week as a year, you roughly get about 500 years. So from the time where the Jerusalem is big, word goes out to be rebuilt to the coming of the Messiah, about 500 years. Look at verse 24. These six things, what will the Messiah do? He'll finish transgression. He'll make an end of sins. He will atone for iniquity. They're all negative, aren't they? Uh, they? They do not say there how the Messiah will deal with sin. They just say that he'll finish off sin. And he'll bring in everlasting righteousness. That's more positive, isn't it? And he'll seal up vision and prophecy, which can mean either he'll finish it or he'll authenticate it. So the Old Testament is fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah and it's finished in him who shows that it's true. And this, the sixth achievement there in verse 24 is to anoint, it's, uh, to, it can be the most holy place or uh, most holy person. It's, it's, it's uh, just it's not clear was talking about a person or a place. Uh, I, I think I'll go with uh, place, as I have here. Uh, in Matthew, which is New Testament, the first book of the New Testament, first of the Gospels, uh, chapter 12 and verse 6, Jesus says, one greater than the temple is here. The temple was where all the sacrifices took place. And Jesus says that he is greater than the temple because he replaced all the sacrifices with one sacrifice. Now, can we pull those together? This, the, the Messiah will achieve this. He'll be cut off, verse 26, meaning he'll die. Uh, and he shall have nothing. Uh, so the Messiah will put an end to Jewish sacrifices. And there have not been sacrifices by the Jews since 
uh, the war with the Romans from AD 66 to 70. What was God doing in finishing off those sacrifices? Well, the Christian says they're fulfilled. This is the shadow. The Old Testament sacrifices are the shadow. This prophecy here, Daniel 9, is pointing to the fulfillment, the sacrifice of the Messiah. He's put to death, not for his own sins, he didn't have any, but for the sins of his people. He makes atonement for his people. Jerusalem would reject him and Jerusalem would be destroyed. And all that took place. So bring these two prophecies together. The Quran says that Jesus is the Christ. You want to know who the Christ is? You want, what's Christ mean? What's Messiah mean? The, the Old Testament, there's a number of places you go to, but in, in Psalm 2 it says the anointed one, the, the Messiah, is the king of the whole world. Not just of the Jews, of the whole world. He, he's God's anointed regent on earth. And Daniel 9 says, the Messiah will suffer. He'll be put to death, but he'll usher in righteousness. Sin shall be dealt with, not his own sins, but the sins of his people. And his own people will reject him. Jerusalem will be destroyed, the Jerusalem that opposed Christ. Right, five minutes. <laughs> now, those, bring those two together. I might only have time for this next point. When you go to the next, to the New Testament, Jesus says this in, in Matthew 22. Remember, he's speaking to a people who expect the coming of the Messiah. They do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they're expecting the Messiah to come. And usually Jesus answers questions, but here he asks uh, the Pharisees a question. And he said, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? Uh, and if you're doing a theology exam, that would be just so simple. Whose son is the Messiah? Well, he's the son of David. Uh, but that's all through the Old Testament. The Messiah to come is the son of David. Uh, well, then Jesus says, what about Psalm 110 and verse 1? Now, Psalm 110 uh, is written by David. And it begins this, this way. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put all your enemies under your feet. And so that's what David writes. And so Jesus said, well, if the Messiah is David's son, how can David also call him his Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, who do you think the second Lord is? That's the Messiah. The Lord said to my Lord, and the victory will go to the Messiah and, and it finishes there the Pharisees couldn't answer him they were, they were baffled and it is baffling unless you accept that Jesus is David's son and also David's Lord the Messiah reigns and rules and the Messiah suffers and the two things happen together in the one person and Jesus, as God's Messiah, is the one who accomplishes all this. Now, all of this is from the Old Testament. All of this is prophesied there. Uh, it cannot be corrupted. There's no reason for a Jew to put those things in. This is then fulfilled, of course, in the New Testament. And that makes sense of other references in the New Testament. Unto us the child is born, unto us the son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's Isaiah uh, chapter 9 and verse 6. And the prophecy of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, he'll be rejected, but his death will be substitutionary. He'll be taking the place of his people. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, the suffering servant, the iniquity of us all. Uh, there's a proclamation of the gospel in the Old Testament, and that will lead to his victory. Uh, if I've got just two minutes, I, 
the summary then is we have a picture of the Messiah from the Old Testament. To the Old Testament prophets, I don't think it was clear, I'm not arguing it was, but there are these texts that when you pull them together, you see they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ. He is the prophet, the prophet of God. So it's not either or, he is the prophet of God, but he's also the word of God. He is the priest, there's also the sacrifice. So the priests offered sacrifices of bulls and goats and lambs. That's all finished because it's fulfilled. Jesus has done it once for all, perfect sacrifice. And, and he's the king. He's the son of David, who was also king of kings, lord of lords. Why, why is he David's son? A, a couple of reasons that makes him king uh, from a human perspective. But that means he can die. He dies. The Messiah comes to die. And why is he David's Lord? That means he comes to rule. He comes to do both. He suffers and he rules. He reigns as king. He suffers as priest. And there is <laughs> salvation. And with all the goodwill I can muster, can I urge you, look at these things. The, the Quran says Jesus is the Christ. What does Christ mean? What does Messiah mean? And, and you see the Old Testament answering that question. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Peter Barnes. Now let me introduce you to our Islamic speaker for tonight, Brother Wasim Razvi. Brother Wasim Razvi is the founder and president of IREA, the Islamic Research and Educational Academy and an electronic engineer by profession. He's an exceptional speaker, presenter of Islam to non-Muslims in Australia in the tradition of Sheikh Ahmed Didat and Brother Imran, who happens to be his mentor. Brother Wasim clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic ahadith, and other religious, other religious scriptures as a basis of conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by non-Muslims. He has been an instrumental in, con in contributing to the youth development over the years. He happens to be an inspiration for many youth, especially those in the field of da'wah and comparative religion. I now call up Brother Wasim Razvi to give his first presentation. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu and Astain, who and Astafiru, when I would be lame in Shururi and Fusina, women say ye are here Amalina. My Yahdi Hilla, who fell a mudilla, woman Yodil Fallahadilla, was had one la illa illa law, was had Anna Muhammad and Abduh Rasulu. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, was Salat was Salama Allah Rasul Hil Karim, while Ali he was Hadi he Ajmain. I would be lame in a shaitan regime, Miss Milah Rahman Rahim. قل هو الله أحد الله السمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected scholars who are present here in the auditorium today Master of Conduct Brother Halabi my colleague Abdul Samia and our esteemed guest speaker Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes and his colleague, and all my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Meaning, may peace, mercy, and blessings of Almighty God Allah be on all of you. The subject of the discussion for tonight, which is the debate Jesus, God man, or servant of God. Before I dwell into the subject itself, let me give a small clarification. I started my talk with a portion or the reading in the language of Arabic. Maybe some of you are not familiar with it, so I just want to assure you it was not a hypnotizing technique. You will all be safe and sound here tonight by the will of God. What we Muslims culturally do is we begin by first praising the Almighty God, Allah, 
and then seeking blessings of God on all the prophets, including Moses, peace be upon him, and Jesus, peace be upon him, and especially the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Coming to the subject, God, Jesus, God-man or servant of God. From the title itself, if one could prove that Jesus is servant of God, then by default, Jesus is not a God-man. If one could prove Jesus is God-man, then by default, Jesus is no more the servant of God. Because that's what the title infers. Let me present to you one verse from the Bible, which is from Book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 13. You can read it there. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, and of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus. God glorified his servant Jesus. For me, this one verse from the Bible, which clearly indicates the position of Jesus in the sight of God, that Jesus is servant of God, is enough for the discussion for tonight. But I won't disappoint you. We will continue for the discussion as all of you have traveled fair distances for an exciting night. And our reverend, esteemed reverend Dr. Peter Barnes, who have flown all the way from Sydney to Melbourne. Although we Melbournians, we have a bit of grudge with the Sydney siders, but today we'll try to be a good host. And I'm sure he will, he will uh, enjoy tonight. Coming back to the subject, Jesus, God-man or servant of God? I will look at this subject from three aspects. First, we will see the status of Jesus in Islam. Then, we will delve into the position of Jesus according to the Bible. What Jesus says about himself, his relationship with God, what does the Old and the New Testament talk about Jesus, peace be upon him. And towards the end, we will see what God is not. For somebody to be God-man, we need to know what God is so that we can decide or reason or understand as a decision whether the person in discussion is God-man or simply servant of God. So let's begin with the status of Jesus in Islam. As a Muslim, we Muslims believe Jesus, peace be upon him, to be one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born miraculously without any male intervention by his mother, Virgin Mary, Mother Mary. We believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, he was Messiah the Christ, meaning the anointed one, as Dr. Peter rightly quoted. We believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, he gave, he healed those born blind and lepers but with God's permission. On the authority of the Quran, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I would say, on the authority of one person, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the entire Muslim world, which today is no less than 1.5 billion people, and many millions and billions of the past, and millions and billions to come in the future, on the authority of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, alone, the entire Muslim world believes, respects, and reveres Jesus, peace be upon him. In fact, no Muslim is a Muslim if he or she does not believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has made belief in Jesus, peace be upon him, an article of faith, such that if somebody denies, is no more a Muslim. Such is the status of Jesus in the house of Islam. To the extent that not just Jesus, peace be upon him, is revered, in the Quran, in the Islamic belief, but even his mother, Mother Mary, is respected and revered a lot. Mother Mary is respected to the extent that there is an entire chapter in the Quran by the name Chapter Mother Mary, chapter number 19 of the Quran. Out of 114 chapters, there is an entire chapter dedicated by the name Mother Mary, and it happens to be a large chapter. 
Further, it is mentioned in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 42 of the Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and when the angels said O Mary Almighty God Allah has chosen you and has purified you and has chosen you above the women of all nations such is the status of Mother Mary in the house of Islam. Not the mother of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Not the wife of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Not the daughter of any other Arab person. But the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him, has the highest position in, amongst the women in the religion of Islam. The point I'm trying to drag is, as a Muslim, we love and respect Jesus and his mother. We try to even imitate them. You know, having the beard looks a little bit like Jesus. Maybe I'm a bit darker, but somewhere relevant. The Muslim women, you see, they wear the hijab. I haven't come across a single image or a statue of Mother Mary anywhere in the world, in any church, without the headscarf. So Muslim women, they try to imitate Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him. That is the status of Jesus in Islam. The name of Jesus in Arabic, in the Quran, is Isa, which is very similar to the original name mentioned in the Greek language of the Bible, which is Isa, Jesus, or Esau. While in the English translation, it is generally referred as Jesus, but that is not the original name as mentioned in the Greek. This name Isa is mentioned in the Quran in no less than 25 different places. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Isa, Jesus, in the Quran by name in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 87. Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59. Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 171. Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116. Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 85. He's mentioned in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 34. In Surah Ahzab, chapter number 33, verse number 7. In Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 13. In Surah Zukhruf, chapter number 43, verse number 63. As well in Surah Tussaf, chapter number 61, verse number 6. In these different places, Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentions Jesus, Isa, by name in the Quran. Such is the status of Jesus in Islam. So through my discussion today, I assure that anything that I say, it is solely in the academic perspective to discuss and challenge each other in order to come to the conclusion of the truth about Jesus, peace be upon him, whether he is God-man or whether he is servant of God. So this was the first aspect that I wanted to present. Let us move to the second aspect, which is what did Jesus, peace be upon him, say about himself? What does Bible say about Jesus, peace be upon him? As the speaker mentioned, Dr. Peter, he mentioned that how Jesus is Messiah, the Christ, mentioned and foretold in the Old Testament. As a Muslim, we believe him to be the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one. But let us see what Jesus himself said about him. What Jesus spoke by himself. In the Bible, you have two portions, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament is after the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, whatever has been written or put down. There are 27 books in the New Testament, according to the Protestant Bible, which is of 66 books. Of these 27 books, these are written by, claimed to be by the disciples, by the historians, by followers, and so and so forth. While they have written, out of the entire New Testament, 10% of that is red letters, which means, which is verbatim words of Jesus, as inspired to the gospel writers. Now let us see what Jesus himself said about him and his relationship with God, compared to what other historians or other writers or other authors wrote in the Bible. Now Jesus, peace be upon him, he says in the New Testament, he refers to Almighty God as your father from Gospel of Matthew, chapter number one, verse number one onwards. He keeps on referring to God as your father, your father, your father, at least 13 times before he starts to refer to him as my father. So Jesus is calling God as your father, which was the culture and the tradition of the Jews to refer to God as father in the sense Abba, which means that, you know, somebody who has created us, who sustains, who provides and protects us. While he does that, he now shows his relationship with God. 
It's mentioned in Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29. Jesus, peace be upon him, says, My Father is greater than all. He says in Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, My Father is greater than I. He says in Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. He says, I, with the Spirit of God, cast out devils. So Jesus, peace be upon him, is saying that whatever I do is by the power of God. Interestingly, in Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, which is a very important evidence in the words of Jesus. It is red-lettered Bible, where Jesus is speaking verbatim and has been recorded accordingly. Jesus says in John 5, 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Now this verse is so explicit that Jesus is brushing off anything and everything that is attributed to him. Any power, any strength, any authority, any miracles, any giving of life to anybody else. Jesus is saying, I by myself, I can of my own self do nothing. I would say he is the last person to be titled God-man when he is explicitly saying, I cannot do anything by myself. He goes further in this verse and he says, I do not seek my will, not my will, but the will of the Father, the Creator. You know, in Arabic, the word Muslim, it means the person who does not choose his will, but the will of the Creator. The one who submits himself to the will of the Creator. If I was to translate this verse from the Bible to Arabic, I would have to translate, Ana Muslimun, I am Muslim. That is the easiest and the most concise translation of this verse in Arabic language. Jesus is saying, I cannot do anything by myself. He is the last person to be titled God-man after that. Moving further, book of Acts chapter number 2, verse number 22, it says, it refers to Jesus and says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. Jesus of Nazareth, the Bible says, a man approved of God. A man approved of God is a prophet of God or a messenger of God or a servant of God. He, a man approved of God is not God. A man approved of God is a servant of God, is an obedient slave of God, is the one who is under the command of God. Moving further, a person comes to Jesus, peace be upon him, in Gospel of Matthew chapter number 19, verses 16 to 17. Behold, one comes to Jesus and he says, good master, what good things shall I do so that I may have eternal life? Now Jesus, instead of first responding to the query, immediately he repudiates the man. He says, why do you call me good? For there is none good except one that is God. Jesus is not even accepting simple terminology of praise such as good and he's saying there is only one good that is God. Why do you call me good? He goes further in Gospel of John chapter 17 verse number 3. Jesus peace be upon him says, and so that they may know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus is separating himself from God entirely. Jesus is saying, Gospel of John chapter 17 verse 3, so that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And in another place, Jesus, peace be upon him, he says, the one who is sent is not greater than the one who sends. Furthermore, if one says, well, see, all of these are verses in the sayings of Jesus, peace be upon him, that's fine. But you know, Jesus is greater than this and Jesus is still God man. Well, I would say if you think somebody is God, then let's put to the last aspect that I want to present, what God is not. God is all-knowing, according to the Quran, according to the Bible. God is all-knowing. If, uh, if God comes and says, I don't know something, then that person is not God. God is all-knowing. Now, in the Bible, if you say, is Jesus God? A Christian might say, yes, he is God. Does God know everything? Yes, God knows everything. Then, does Jesus know everything? If he is fully God and fully man, does he know everything? A Christian would say yes. But if you look at the Bible, at least in various places, for example, in Gospel of Mark, chapter number 13, verse number 32, Jesus 
is mentioned where he says, nobody knows of the hour, that is the day of judgment, neither the son except the father. So Jesus is clarifying, I do not know it. So when Jesus does not know, he does not have the knowledge of the hour. He is clarifying, I have got, not, I have got no knowledge of this thing. That means Jesus is not God-man. If he was fully man and fully God, he would have known everything that God knows. I may act, for example, right now I'm a speaker, but at the same time I'm still a father of four kids. I remain the father of four kids while I'm on the stage. Good. But I don't forget my kids. While I'm performing another position, I will not, my knowledge will not change. If my knowledge is changing, then I'm not God. So if Jesus is God-man, then Jesus should have known it, but Jesus does not know. And there are many such instances. Coming towards the last portion, towards the conclusion, I will present two verses. One from the Bible and one from the Quran. The verse from the Bible that I want to present is from Book of Numbers, chapter number 23, verse number 19. If you can put it up there. God is clearly saying in the Old Testament, who is God and who is not God? God is clarifying it. God says, God is not a man, for he should lie. Nor neither the son of man that he should repent. I say, this is so explicit, so clear. God is saying in the Old Testament, God is not a man and God is not a son of man. Who is son of man? Ask any learned Christian. Who is son of man? They say it's Jesus. Who is son of God? They would say it's Jesus. So if son of man is Jesus, God is saying God is not a man and God is not a son of man. So at least Jesus is not God-man, according to the explicit, clear verses of the Bible. I would conclude from the verses of the Quran, from Surah Ikhlas, Surah number 112, Ayah number 124, and I say, this is my humble request to see, to ponder, to think further, the criteria of who is God, who fits the definition of God, because the Jews and the Christians at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they, before the advent of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, the Jews and the Christians of Arabia would call God very comfortably as Allah. So when Prophet Muhammad started to talk about Allah, Jews and Christians came and asked him, who is this Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4. If anybody fits this four-line definition, then that person is God, and we Muslims have no issue in taking that person God. But if Jesus does not fit these verses, then we say Jesus is not a God-man, rather he is the servant of God. The four verses, the four criteria of somebody being God is... Say, He is Allah, He is Almighty God, the one and only. Allah Samad, who is absolutely independent. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, He has no children, nor was He begotten. He does not have any parents or father. Walam yakullahu kufuwan ahad. And there is nothing like unto Him. I conclude by putting forward this humble request. That if Jesus fits this, then we have no issues. But I would say, Jesus never would fit this. He never fit into this definition in the past. He will not be able to fit into this definition today and he will never be able to fit into this definition ever in the future. So Jesus is not the God-man, rather the servant of God. Um, so now I'll call up uh, Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes just for 10 minute uh, rebuttal session. Thank you. Thank you. I shall try to speak as uh, quickly as Wasim has. Uh, he set quite a, a, a precedent there. Very quick. I'll just go through a number of quick points. Firstly, it's not an either or. Uh, that was Wasim's first point. Uh, but of course Jesus is called the servant of God. He's the, he's, who fulfills the suffering servant of Isaiah 53? Well, it's Jesus. So, of course he's the, the servant. The Messiah is the suffering servant of God. So uh, it is not either or, it's both and. To be someone who dies, Jesus has to be true man. There's no argument at all about whether he's true man. Of course he is true man, therefore he is the servant of God. And that's what Peter means in Acts 3. That's got all sorts of uh, background uh, to those who are listening to him in Acts 3 because they're Jews. Uh, they know the servant passages of, of Isaiah and uh, to, uh, to say Jesus is God's servant, that uh, is saying much more to them 
than what it is saying to Wasim. Uh, if you only want to go with a red-letter Bible, that's fine. Uh, the 10% of, of the Bible, of New Testament being red-letter, which are the words of Christ, but there's plenty of words of Christ. For example, Matthew 28, he, he tells his disciples to baptise people in the name, name, one name, of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, not names. Uh, that's red letter. There's red letters everywhere and you won't get simply a servant from that. You'll get a servant who is more than a servant. You'll get one who is uh, the Lord who's become a, a servant. Uh, when Jesus says that the Father is greater than he, well, can you imagine any preacher on earth, any prophet from the Old Testament saying, you know, today my sermon is going to be on God is greater than I am. Uh, you'd be looking for another job, I would think. Uh, Jesus has to say it because of a number of things that he said earlier. I and the Father are one and, and a great many other passages. Uh, and then in the incarnation, Jesus becomes the God-man. As the God-man, he, he lowers himself, he empties himself. Uh, and so it's like a... I, I had four sons, uh, four sons, but they're grown now... But if you go out and play football with them, uh, when they were you know, eight, nine, ten years old, I'd play down to them. Uh, and there was something like that taking place in the incarnation, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. That's what Charles Wesley said, and that's what the Bible's saying. In, there's a, a, a veiling of the divinity, uh, and therefore in the incarnation, the Father is greater than the Son because the Son takes on the lowliness of humanity. Uh, he eats, he drinks, uh, he falls asleep, uh, he suffers and he dies. He does all those things. He, he undergoes terrible shame and humiliation. God cannot do those things. God cannot die. Uh, that's how God is different from man. In the incarnation, he becomes true man. In John 5, verse 30, that's, that's not a declaration of weakness. That's a declaration of strength. Jesus said he only carries out his Father's will. He, he means he never sinned. Uh, in, let, let me go to Mark 13 first, and then maybe some others. Mark 13, uh, Jesus says that he does not know the time of the second coming. Now, I would want to press what well, I see him. Uh, Mark 13, verse 32, I'll read it to you. Concerning that day or that hour, the second coming, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Do you believe that text? If you believe that text, you've got to take it in its entirety. What is Jesus saying? Where is he placing himself? He, he's saying nobody knows the date of the second coming. And fine. Not even the angels, nor even the sun. There's an ascending order there. Human beings don't know. The angels don't know. The very Son of God doesn't know. On earth, he doesn't know. You cannot quote that text and say, I believe that text and it shows you that Jesus doesn't know the date of the second coming, which I agree, that's what it says. Unless you take the whole of the text, because Jesus is very obviously saying he is above the angels. His status is above the angels. That's what's so startling about it. In the emptying of the deity, the word made flesh, he, he five minutes, that's more than I thought. Uh, he, he does not know the date of the second coming, but he's above the angels. Think that one through. Who is above the angels? Of course, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us only God is above the angels. When in, in John 17, Jesus says that uh, it's a high priestly prayer. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. He's not radically separating himself from God all the way through. He's done quite the reverse. So in, in John 14, verse 9, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. So what is God like? I'm not here to say, look, I'll give you some idea what God's like. 
you know, maybe I could talk about um, you know, John Newton, Amazing Grace, and the story of his life, and that'll give you some idea what God's like, his holiness and his graciousness. But Jesus is not saying that. He's saying, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's nothing more to be added to. So the Christian says, I'll tell you what God is like. He is exactly like Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is exactly like God. He's the very image of the invisible God. Uh, and so that's John 14 and verse 9. In Matthew 19, where the rich young ruler, who, who's religious, by the way, it's, uh, he's a ruler of the synagogue, he comes to Jesus and he, he asks this question, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what's he thinking? I can do a good thing. That'll somehow give me credit or something and I'll be able to go to heaven. I'll get eternal life. When Jesus said, why do you ask me about what's good? He's not, is he saying he's not good? Surely you don't believe that. Jesus is good. What he's saying is, you should not call me good in that sense, that divine sense, unless you know who I am. And Jesus then answers him in a, a way which, if you read the rest of the Gospels, is quite extraordinary. He says, you want the law, I'll give you the law. So he gives him the Ten Commandments, or a representative list. And, and the man, man says, well, I've done all those things. You know, I ticked all those boxes. <laughs> I'm safe. And Jesus says, well, I'll give you some more law. You want to be perfect, go and sell what you have, give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. And the disciples get worried. If this is the way to the kingdom of God, who's there? There'd be about three people. That's what they get worried about. And the whole point of it is this. This man does not know a way of salvation. Jesus says it's this. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. That's the point of the story. The rich young ruler said, with, with me, it's possible. <laughs> I've done all these things, all these good things from my youth up. And Jesus doesn't say he's a liar. He doesn't say he's a womanizer, an adulterer, and a murderer, and a thief. He doesn't say that. I think outwardly he was quite a decent man. You'd, you'd want him in your church. <laughs> but but he's, he thinks he can save himself. And Jesus says, no, with man it's impossible. It's impossible because of sin. We, we don't present ourselves to the infinite holiness of God as those who can save ourselves. We are not our own saviours. No man can see God and live, but in Christ Jesus, we do see God and live. That's it? Yep. <laughs> one more minute. Okay, he's very kindly, <laughs> Mohammed. <laughs> okay, one last text I'll deal with. In uh, Acts chapter 2, where Jesus... Uh, is pronounced, to, this is, uh, of course, the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's Peter's words, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God. Now, of course he's a man. Why? Do, why, why he, he's on common ground with the knee. He's a man attested by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. He's telling them something they know. And when he goes on, they also know this, because it, it, that's, that's verse 22, but it doesn't finish there. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You know, Isaiah 53, remember that? You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He could not stay dead because there was no sin in him. God was always well pleased with his son. And so, yes, he's a man attested by God, but more than that. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes. Um, now I would like to call Brother Wasim for his 10-minute rebuttal. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. A'udhu billahi minash shaytani rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Wa qul jaa al-haq wa zahaqa al-batil. Inna al-batil kana zahuqa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, when truth is hurled, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is bound to perish. I have, you know, I appreciate Dr. Peter Barnes. 
He has tried to cover in 10 minutes all the verses that, the, that I've put forward. He's tried to attempt to give an explanation to all of that. All I would say is a wonderful explanation is not an evidence in itself. What we are discussing today, the title of the discussion or the debate is Jesus, God man or servant of God. This is the subject. The subject is not Jesus, God man and servant of God. No. If you agree with me that Jesus is servant of God, ahlan wa sahlan. Thanks a lot, Dr. Peter Burney, because Peter Barnes, because that's exactly what the whole discussion is. Either God man or servant of God. If we both agree Jesus is servant of God, a servant is never God. A servant can never be God. A servant is always subordinate to God. And that is exactly the subject of discussion that we have today. Let me put forward some of the aspects that we have uh, seen in the first session that uh, Dr. Peter has put forward. For example, he mentioned book of Isaiah, chapter number nine, verse number six, which mentions about a child, a son, who is mighty counselor, everlasting father, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, if you go to the original text of this verse, book of Isaiah, chapter number nine, verse number six, Hebrew is the language of the Old Testament, and Hebrew and Arabic are sister languages. For example, Allah says in the Quran, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. He is Allah the one and only. Ahad is so explicit, it eradicates, eliminates all possibilities of a dual, multiple, triune God. Ahad means only one. And in Hebrew, in the Old Testament, book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4, Moses, peace be upon him, says the first commandment of God, which Jesus, peace be upon him, repeats in the New Testament as well. In Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, repeats exactly the same verbatim words in Hebrew. Shama Israelu, Adonai ilaheinu Adonai Ichad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Ichad. Hebrew Ichad, Arabic Ahad. Absolutely only one. So Quran says God is only one, Ahad. Hebrew says Ichad, God is only one. Repeated by Moses and repeated by Jesus verbatim. So God is absolutely only one. A dual God, a God with a son, a son with a father. It is no discussion. There is no imagination of such a God man in the entire Old Testament by any of the prophet over thousands of years. Coming back to the point. So when we say that in book of Isaiah chapter 9 verse number 6, the Hebrew word used there for son is wulidu. Wulidu in Hebrew means the son who was already born. It's a past tense. It is not referring to the future son, referring to Jesus, peace be upon him. No, it was referring to a son who was already born. Mighty God, mighty God amongst the Jews in certain cultures, it was a common term to call somebody who is king as mighty God. Somebody who is too strong to call him mighty God. Everlasting father, a person who gives, you know when you say when you are watching a soccer match, right? And Muhammad Salah, he makes you win, right? And you say, Salah, great, keep going. Salah, you keep alive, alive. What you say is you live for long. That is everlasting father. This was the culture of the Jews to say it. So book of Isaiah chapter 9 verse number 6 is not referring to Jesus at all. So that is one point. The other is he raised about book of Psalms chapter 110 verse number 1. It says, Lord said to my Lord. So here the Christians generally say that see there are two lords here. Which means the first Lord is God the Father and the second Lord is God the Son. If you go back to the original again, I've got the RSV here, revised standard version of the Bible. It writes it this way. Lord, with a capital L, said to my Lord, small L-O-R-D. Why capital and small? Because the small L-O-R-D is not referring to God. The first Lord in Greek is Yahweh. The second Lord in, so in Hebrew, sorry. The first Lord is Yahweh. The second Lord is Adonai. It is not Yahweh. That is not referring to God. So these are just some of the points that I wanted to raise. Furthermore, Dr. Peter mentioned that Jesus did not know the hour. And which is his second coming. We Muslims, as we know, we all believe in the second coming of Jesus. And we are waiting eagerly for Jesus to return. But again, as I said, I wanted to hear some evidence where Jesus is God-man. I haven't really come across much of the evidence from the Bible at all where Jesus is God-man. 
If Jesus is God, man, the simple thing for Jesus was to say when he was walking throughout the earth for over 32 to 33 years, when God came down from the word to flesh and came here as the begotten son of God, as somebody, a Messiah, I would have expected him to simply say me these words, I am God. It wouldn't be too hard. Or he says, worship me. There is not a single verse in the entire Bible, in any Bible. You know, I had a couple of, couple of copies of Bible here. So, you know, we, right before we started, Dr. Peter reminded me, he said, that looks a lot of books. Yeah, well, what can I do? Bible, there are a couple of Bibles that are out there. So I have to pick up all of them just to make sure which one I pick up the right one. There is a Bible with 66 books. There is a Bible with 73 books. There is a Bible with 78 books. There's a Bible with 87 books. The Bibles keep changing from one to the other. Then within the 66 books of the Bible, there is Bible with King James Version, the first English version. Then there is a Bible with a Revised Standard Version where some of the verses of the Bible have been removed. Then there is a further version. Then there is New International Version. Every couple of years, another version comes which refutes, removes some of the verses of the previous Bible, claiming that that was corruption and addition in the word of God. So this is what it is all happening there. Now in this, I would say that Jesus does not know, if Jesus does not know, if he was God man, he should have indicated somewhere, he should have said, I am God or worship me. There is not a single unequivocal statement in any Bible of the world where Jesus said, I am God or where he said, worship me. If that was the case, we Muslims would have had no objection in accepting it. But interestingly, that does not exist. Instead, I would like to present the verse from the Bible, book of Jobs, chapter number 25, verse number 4 to 6. My memory is now about to end, all right? So, uh, Book of Jobs, chapter number 25, verses 4 to 6. If you could put it on the screen. It reads in the Old Testament, this should be the nail in the coffin. Can anyone, any man, any son of man, any son of God, the begotten son of God, Jesus, peace be upon him, or anybody, can that person be God or not according to the criteria of God fit in the Old Testament? God does not change from Old to New Testament. God remains the same. The nature of God remains the same. Let's see what God says. God says, how then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? God is saying anybody who is born of a woman is not clean. When Jesus was born, his mother had to go for 40 days for uncleanliness. Jesus who was born, who is a pure, who is a holy child according to the understanding of Christian church, his mother had to go through the uncleaned 40 days. God says, behold, even to the moon and it shines not. Yeah, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a maggot. You know what is maggot? The wombs that eat the human dung. So God is saying to me, you men, you humans, you are maggots. You are dirty worms. And he goes further. The son of man. Who is son of man? Ask any Christian. Jesus. Son of man is Jesus. God says, and the son of man, which is a womb. For God, men, son of God, son of man, are creation, tiny creation, who are womb, worms, maggots, without any shyness, without any strength. While this is happening, I say, Jesus cannot be, can never be God man, even according to the Bible, far away from the criteria of the Quran. I did not hear the refutation or the explanation for the four verses of Surah Ikhlas, Surah number one and 12, ayah number one to four. I would like to conclude with a very humble request to our esteemed guest, Dr. Peter Barnes, while you see and while you can see rationally and think that Jesus, peace be upon him, is not claiming to be God-man, which you yourself attest that Jesus is servant of God, then why not move forward to accept what Jesus accepted himself, where Jesus in John 5.30 said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my will, but the will of the Father, the Creator who sent me. That is the definition of being a Muslim. In the religion of Islam, which is the name given by God to a religion, no scripture in the world has the name of the religion. The Bible does not say Christianity is the religion of God. The Bible does not say Judaism is the religion of God. No scripture in the world, Hinduism doesn't say Hinduism is the religion of God. It is only Islam. It is only the Islamic scripture which says Islam is the chosen religion of God, which is the same religion of all the prophets. Because Jesus said, I take not my will, but the will of the creator who sent me. I invite our respected 
Dr. Peter, to look into this and come forward to the house of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 19 and Ayah number 85, Inna dina indallah al-Islam. Verily, the only religion acceptable in the sight of God is al-Islam. Jesus, peace be upon him, said, as recorded in the Quran, as part of gospel of Injil, Jesus says in Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 51, Inna Allah rabbi wa rabbukum fa'buduhu. Verily, Allah, the Almighty God, is my Lord and your Lord. So worship Him alone. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alam. Okay, just to go through uh, the rules of the questions and answers, I'll just go through them. So some of the rules. Um, so let's keep the questions short and simple. No long questions or mini lectures. Um, speakers will have five minutes to answer. So both speakers will have five minutes to answer. We're not here to debate each other. So if you have a question, please, in a sentence or two. So let's keep it short. Only one question per person. If you have more questions, go back at the end of the line and wait for your turn. Please, so others can have another, another chance to uh, ask questions as well. Once the debate is finished, you can come to the speakers and ask more questions as well. So, brothers, we'll start with the first question, if that's possible, please. So, sorry, just to remember, the first question is for uh, Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes, yes? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Reverend uh, Peter Barnes, for your presentation. Uh, so my question is just a re reiteration of uh, what uh, Wasim Rizvi just uh, uh, mentioned. So the issue of Jesus is a great matter which has caused many questions and controversy. So if something is a fundamental part of religion, it is expected that it would be made very clear and explicit. Just as the oneness of God is made very clear in the first commandment in the Bible and is made the first pillar of Islam, so if, the, if Jesus is God and the Son of God, why has he not made it explicit and made sure that there was no room for any doubt or controversy. Thank you. Actually, let, let, me, uh, let me reply with scripture. Uh, we, we have to take the manhood seriously and we have to take the deity seriously and the Old Testament does that. Um, if I can go back to Isaiah 9-6 and then I'll take you to a, a couple of New Testament texts. I don't think this is unre unrepresentative at all. It, Isaiah 9, 6, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. So far, what are you thinking? What's a human being? Son is born, a child. You know, so, uh, child is born, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Now, you didn't call it, no Jew would call a man God. But here we have a both and. It's not either or. I took the, qu the debating question to be Jesus, at the God man, or just God's servant? He is God's servant. He is man here. In the, the, this is prophecy. This is about 700 BC. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the next verse to whom is this referring? Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end and on the throne of david his king there hasn't been a throne of david in a earthly sense since you know, the babylonians destroyed jerusalem in about 587 bc that's 2500 2600 years ago but there is a king a king not of this world uh, the son of man is the king in god's kingdom in daniel 7 here on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness and from this time forth and forevermore. This is not something transitory. It'll be here today and gone tomorrow. This is forever. And when you get to the New Testament, so that's the Old Testament. It raises those questions. I'm not saying in the Old Testament everybody understood exactly what was going to take place. They didn't. But when you get to the New Testament, Jesus is clear. Here's John 5 and verse 23. So that all may honour the Son just as they honour the Father. You honour the Son in the same way you honour the Father. And in, why was Jesus crucified? 
What, what did the Jews object to? They objected to what they th thought was his blasphemy. There's no way you can present Jesus as just a good man who wanders around Galilee and, and Judea and somehow people start to think he's God. You know? and well, what a terrible mistake they made. It, they understood what he was claiming. And so in, in John 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. You want to know who I am? Before Abraham was, that's 2,000 years before. Abraham's about 2,000 BC. Before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, but I am. If someone spoke that in English, you'd say oh, they got the grammar all wrong. But Jesus speaks the language of Yahweh. Yahweh, I am who I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And they understand what he's saying. They don't believe what he's saying, but they understand what he's saying. So verse 59, they picked up stones to throw at him. Now, they didn't do that because they thought he was mad. They just lock him up for a while. They did that because of Levitical laws against blasphemy. You blaspheme God. And they said, here he is claiming to be eternal as God is eternal. He can't possibly be so because we can see in front of us as a human being. Therefore, he, he is a blasphemer. He's not a good man. I, he's the worst of men. That's the problem. Uh, it, 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 you can't say Jesus is good unless you go further than that. Say Jesus is divine. It doesn't make any... If I said, I am the incarnation of the deity, I wouldn't be a good man. I'd be the worst man. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. They rejected so they pick up stones to stone him for blasphemy. And you get that through, uh, the, through the whole New Testament. It, it's telling us Jesus is true man and it's telling us that Jesus is true God. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question from the, from the brother's side. Uh, is that for Brother Wasim Razvi? Ah, uh, yes. Yep, no worries. Brother Wasim? Uh, how are you going? Uh, also, if I could clarify a point, the, the teacher there was kept saying that son of man means Jesus every time. That's incorrect because when you read the book of Ezekiel, he called Ezekiel the son of man many times. So son of man just meaning a descendant of man. So yep. just to clarify that. But uh, my question is uh, the virgin birth. Now in Christianity, we, when we go to the book of Luke, uh, we see Mary's bloodline go all the way back to Adam. Adam being the son of God, because we understand the divinity of Jesus Christ. What was the purpose, according to Islam, the virgin birth? Sure. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So first of all, um, the brothers mentioned that, you know, I've been referring to son of man, uh, especially in the Old Testament where I presented some of the verses. I said son of man is not necessarily referring to Jesus alone. Uh, it is at times referring to Ezekiel as well. Agreed. Agreed. That's exactly my point. Whether you call somebody son of man or son of God, these titles are not explicit for Jesus. So when these titles are not explicit for Jesus, what greater position Jesus has compared to any other prophet? Jesus, Moses, David, Abraham, all the prophets of God, they had miracles given to them, they had abilities given to them, they had powers given to them, and they are all equal in that sense. This insistence that Jesus is something more is the concern. For example, Dr. Peter, he mentioned right in the beginning in his first presentation that Jesus is Messiah from the Quran and Jesus is Messiah in the Bible and that Messiah is someone superior. Well, Messiah is referred to in the Bible to many other prophets as well, even to the kings. As he himself mentioned, Cyrus was referred as the king who was referred in the Bible in the Old Testament as Messiah. He even, the Bible says he will rule and conquer the all nations. Jesus never conquered anything in the world. Jesus, while he was on this earth, John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus said, this kingdom is not of mine. The kingdom of this world is not of mine. He never ruled this world. Yes, when he comes back, I, you, we all will assist him to rule it. No issues. But for while he was here, he never ruled. So none of those prophecies fulfill for Jesus. It is talking about another king who ruled the world. Jesus never ruled this earth 
while we are here. And the Bible is testimony to that. Jesus never ruled. So thanks, definitely you are right that, you know, Jesus alone is not the son of man, but God makes it explicitly clear. Man, God will never be a man. God will never be a son of man. So why are we calling Jesus son of man in the entire New Testament? Jesus is referred as son of man 83 times and only referred as son of God 13 times. Why is Jesus referred son of man so many times? If he's referred, yet he is not the only one, agreed. I am with you on that point. So coming to the other aspect, I just wanted to add, you know, some of the points that were raised. Isaiah 9.6, the quotation that Dr. Peter mentioned, referring to the king, the counselor, the mighty God, and that he will rule. As I said, John 18.36, Jesus said, this kingdom is not of mine. He did not rule. So it is not about Jesus. Rather, as I said, 9-6, Isaiah is talking about an already born child that was referring to another person. Coming to crucifixion, you know, he mentioned why was Jesus there and why did Jesus die on the cross? And also, as you mentioned, the point that what's the point of Jesus being born without a father, right? This is exactly how God tests people and work and, and gives them miracles. With Moses, did Moses have miracles? Where Moses put the Thing, and the ocean separated. Why? Why can't just Moses fight and defeat Pharaoh? He can. That's the plan of God. God tests people. Melchizedek in the Bible, according to book of Hebrews, chapter number 7, verse number 1, it mentions about a person by the name Melchizedek who did not have a beginning, who did not have an end, who did not have parents, who did not have children. Much superior than Jesus. If somebody is God-man, Melchizedek is God-man. Could I answer that? Melchizedek. Sure. I'll, I'll let you know. In, That's fine. In, yeah, okay. Let me just finish. Yeah, yeah. So with Melchizedek, Jesus is there who is born without a father. Melchizedek without a father, without a mother. Much more superior than Jesus. From an Islamic perspective, Jesus was born miraculously as a miracle to people of that time. And the people, those who believe in him, we Muslims, we still believe in him that he was born without a male intervention. Yes, Jews reject it. Some of the Christians also reject the male, you know, Jesus being born without a male father. But from an Islamic perspective, we do not have any issue on the authority of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So coming to this last point of crucifixion, where in Hebrews chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 8, Bible says, God listened to the prayer of Jesus and saved him from the death on the cross. Book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 7 to 8. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from the death. The Bible confirms that Jesus cried to God with tears, asking for security, and God was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Even the, uh, what do you call, the, the miracle that Jesus did giving life to the dead, especially to his friend Lazarus, what does Gospel of John chapter 11, verse 41 to 42 say about giving life to the dead? Did Jesus say, I give life to the dead? Never. Jesus never said, I give life to the dead. In Gospel of John chapter 11, verse, 1, verse 41 to 42, Jesus, peace be upon him, he is crying, he is groaning. That's what the Bible says. He's groaning. He's saying, oh God, you have always heard my prayers. You have always listened to me. And I know you will listen to me again. And he says, I make this loud so that these people know that you have sent me. Jesus is praying to God to get the miracle so that he can give life to the Lazarus. Not by himself, as in Gospel of John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing. And Jesus, and then we have people who are saying, he is God, man. I would say that that is absolutely incorrect based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. Hope that answers the question. My question is to the reverend. Um, you stated that Jesus had to be um, holy, a man, um, the, suffering, the suffering servant of God in order to die. And then you stated that Jesus is the very image of God. Um, isn't that slightly contradictory? Well, I don't know. From my perspective, it's, it's not at all. Uh, Jesus is true man, he's representative man, he represents us to God and he is true God, he represents God to us. So uh, this is Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells, present tense, bodily. Uh, so he is both uh, and we, anything I can uh, compare it to is in the incarnation in Philippians 2 
Paul says he empties himself. And so to say that he suffers, uh, to say that he falls asleep, to say that he does all these things human is, is not, not a threat to the... To, to the it's, it's from the New Testament. The New Testament says these things about him. But it also quotes him as saying, for example, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, you can't say that unless you're divine. I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And so Jesus is the king of a kingdom. And he never conquered anything, Wasim said. He conquered the last enemy, death itself. I have not met most of you, and you've not met me, but we've all got the same problem, to different degrees. We're all sinners, and we're all going to die. That's your problem, and that's my problem. And Jesus' death pays the penalty for sin, and Jesus' resurrection defeats death. So the two problems that you have, and everybody else on the planet have, have been dealt with by Jesus. To, to carry that out, he has to be God and man in the one person. Otherwise, if he's man, he, he cannot speak, I am the resurrection and the life. He, he raises himself from the dead. He lays it down and he takes it back again. It's true that the Father raises him from the dead. The, the Bible speaks interchangeably on those sort of issues to show the deity of Christ and the true humanity of Christ. The suffering is real. Um, Hebrews chapter 5, you know, he, he's crying out to God. God saves him, not from death, but through death. It's pointing to the resurrection, the great news of the defeat of death. Um, so you kind of half answered my first question um, about whether or not you believe that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies in the Torah. Um, probably not. Uh, but that also leads me to ask you, um, if not a fulfilment of prophecies uh, while Jesus was here um, on earth, why would you hope in a Messiah to come back home um, unless he was both God and man? Thank you. The sisters asked the question that as a Muslim, you know, we claim or we believe that in the prophecies of the Torah, of the Old Testament, generally, are probably yes or probably no as well as you mentioned. Uh, but the question is, if Jesus is going to return back as a Messiah, he's going to come back. Uh, you're talking about the second coming, right? Yes. Yeah. So when Jesus is coming back, when is it not that he is God-man? Now, interestingly, even in the Bible, there are stories where people were considered dead for a period of time and they came back to life. Even before Jesus, that does not necessarily mean somebody who comes back is God-man. As I was saying in my talk, the concept of God-man did not exist in the entire Old Testament. No Jew, no Jewish prophet ever taught to their disciples or ever worshipped any God-man. This has been completely out of discussion in the entire Jewish tradition, which, which spreads over thousands of years. There is not a single incident where Jews or any prophet in the Old Testament worshipped God-man. This is completely against the concept of God, one God. Coming to the subject, why is Jesus coming back? Interestingly, Jesus answers that. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21. When Jesus returns, they will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, we have done wonders and miracles in your name. Who will call Jesus Lord? Jews? No. Muslims? No. Hindus? No. Atheists? Agnostics? No. Who will call Jesus Lord, Lord? Christians, what is the response of Jesus? Jesus will say to them, you people of iniquity, I know you not. Get away from me. Jesus will push these people away. Who will call him Lord, Lord, we have done miracles and wonders in your name. Why is Jesus pushing them? What iniquity have they done? They are calling him Lord. And Jesus is saying, go away, get away from me. You have done wonders and miracles in my name. That's fine, doesn't matter. Go away from me. What explanation is there except that Jesus is coming back to clarify that he is not God-man? That would be my response to that. If I've got a few minutes, yep. yeah. I'll, just, I'll just touch base 
as you know, um, the, Dr. Peter mentioned, especially one of the interesting verses from the Bible Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 58, which actually where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So the Christians generally say, see, here when Jesus said, I am, this is the same I am that God used in book of Exodus in the Old Testament in chapter 3, verse 14, where God said, I am who I am. So this I am is sort of a title for God. So God has used it for himself. Now Jesus, while responding to the Jews who were questioning him, who were challenging him, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Now see, let, let's think about it. First of all, from, a, from the scriptural point of view, First point, from the scriptural perspective. The word God used I am in the Old Testament is ho-on, the original. The problem generally what happens is we are all reading the English text, the English translation, which keeps changing from time to time, from Bible to Bible, from version to version. Let's go back to the original. The word I am that God used in the Old Testament is ho-on. If Jesus is going to use the same I am, what should be the word in, in the New Testament? Ho-on. For your information, the word that Jesus uses in John 8.58 is ego emi. It is that mis mistake or willingness or an intentional mistake of the Bible translators who want you to believe that Jesus is God. But in reality, the original text does not have anything that indicates that Jesus is God. Furthermore, interestingly, if somebody wants to call Jesus God, the Bible has many gods. Bible has many people called as God. Jesus calls Jews as gods. When Jews wanted to attack Jesus, they picked up the stones in Gospel of John chapter number 10, verse number 30. They wanted to attack Jesus from 1023. Jesus asked them, for what good things do you stone me? They said, not for the good things, but for the blasphemy. What is the blasphemy? That you claim to be someone godly. So you know what Jesus says? Is it not written in your law that you all are gods? Jesus is saying to Jews who are picking up stones to kill him for blasphemy, he's saying to them, is it not written in your law that you all are gods? That's the Bible. Gospel of John chapter number 10 verse number 34. Furthermore, book of Exodus, where God says, it is said to Moses, you are a god to Pharaoh. God. What you see entirely in the Bible, the word God does not necessarily mean you are God. It means you are a prophet of God. The word Lord in the Bible does not mean you are Lord. It, you know, how, if you go to the court in Australia, to the, any, any of the courts, what do you call the judge? My Lord. My Lord. Why do you call that? It's a Jewish tradition. The, Jew, the, the disciples of Jesus are calling Jesus Lord because that's what the tradition that the Jews had. The disciples of Jesus were strong Jewish monotheists. They'd never thought of a God-man. They were calling all the rabbis, the scholars as Lord, so they called Jesus also as Lord. Now, what mistake had happened is people started to consider Jesus as now God-man. That is why Jesus is returning to rectify, to correct people that there is no God-man. And that is why God sent Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to clarify this and to bring back to oneness of God the same teachings that the previous prophets brought, including the teaching of Jesus, peace be upon him. Thank you. <clears throat> Yep, next question. Yeah, thanks, brother. Uh, thanks, uh, Reverend uh, Prince. Uh, my question is for you is uh, about uh, Jesus' responsibilities as a God uh, towards the universe. So what his uh, responsibilities towards the universe, how he, did he maintain it as a God-man? Uh, how did he maintain the, new, the universe during his death? And what is the responsibilities of Jesus after this? His responsibilities to the universe. Let me go to Hebrews and, and to uh, chapter 1. And Hebrews was cited earlier. And here's the introduction. How does the Old Testament fit, to the New Testament, fit with the New Testament? That, that is a really crucial issue because this appeal back to the Old Testament and to say that nobody worships a man as God in the Old Testament. Of course, that's true. That's the whole point. Uh, and so when you get to the New Testament, and here you don't have a man who is God, it's a God who's, God who's become man. And that's not, an, that's not an easy thing to say in Galilee or in Jerusalem. Who is Jesus and what's he doing now? He, let me read. This is long ago at many times, and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these days he's spoken to us by his son. 
Is Jesus a prophet? Yes, but he's more than a prophet. He's, he's the son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. You're asking me details about what... Christ does in upholding the universe I can only say the Bible declares that he does I don't know how he does it it's, it's not my realm uh, he does it because of who he is and this is the one who's come from heaven and returns to heaven and he returns with the people he, he, you enter the kingdom through the blood of the king and so he has won a kingdom for himself. He, he, the son of man in Old Testament is, is often just man. Ezekiel is addressed as son of man. And what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him in Psalm 8? Son of man just means man there. But in, in Daniel chapter 7, the son of man is the king in God's kingdom. It's over and above anybody else. And Caiaphas... The high priest knows this. And so at the trial of, of Jesus, he, he says to him, uh, tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you that from now on you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, he is, he is referring back to Daniel the prophet Daniel, chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. So this is something we can check. Can I, can I say with the Quran you can't check this? Because you only know about the prophets through Muhammad. He talks about Abraham, he talks about Isaac, he talks about Jacob, so on. There's no other way in. But the Bible is an unfolding library that fits together. There's a, one divine mind behind it. And so you can go back. Caiaphas is... Caiaphas is clearly rejecting that Jesus is this son of man who's the king in God's kingdom. He doesn't believe that. And that's why he says it's blasphemy. The high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. But Jesus is, is saying he's the king in God's kingdom. He rules this kingdom. He rules this universe. Uh, he, we're, we're not at the last page now. We're heading towards the last page. But the last page will be the consummation of the victory that he's already won. That's what the Bible says. How he works that. You know, how is he doing that now? You're asking me to get into the, the mind and the mechanics of how the Godhead works. and I, No man can answer <coughs> that. We ought to know what we do know and ought to know what we, we can't know. But the Bible tells us Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it does tell us that. 30 You're, seconds. How many minutes? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> and so it says, Philippians 2, every knee will bow to him. Every knee. And recognise him as Lord. I know I've only got... <laughs> Matthew 7. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. That's true. Will there be false Christians? Yes. That's what he's warning against. Jesus is the judge. You notice in Matthew 7? He's the one who judges. He decides your eternal destiny. And in, in Luke 6, 46, he says, why do you call me Lord if you don't obey me? That's the whole point of Matthew 7 too. If he, Jesus is Lord, we obey him. And one quick thing, uh, as Exodus 3, verse 14, in the Greek translation, it is ego, I me. Uh, I am who I am. Uh, so in John 8, uh, 58, Jesus says, before Abraham is, was, I am. He, he's very much saying what is said in Exodus 3 and verse 14, in the Greek. The question is for Wasim. Uh, Wasim, uh, just, I believe you said that Jesus never claimed to be God. And I'm looking at John chapter 10 that you referred to just earlier. But in John chapter 10 and verse... Uh, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. 
That is, after just claiming two verses earlier that he can give eternal life. After claiming that I and the Father are one, the Jews pick up stones to stone him. And Jesus says, I've shown you many miracles, great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And they say in verse 33, verse 33 we are not stoning you for any of these, but for blasphemy, because you are mere man claimed to be God. So while not using the word, this is clearly their understanding of what Jesus says. And he says a few verses later at the end of verse 38 that if that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So how do you respond to Perfect. this? Perfect. Thanks a lot. Thanks for this question. I really appreciate that because we were missing this aspect. The brother has quoted Gospel of John chapter number 10, verse number 30, where Jesus says, I and my Father are one. So generally, the Christian claims, see, Jesus has clarified here that I and my Father are one. I ask every Christian who brings this verse to me, what is the context? You know, when you tell it something, then there is a context. What's the context? Jesus is saying the context there, one in purpose or one in nature. The Jews were picking up stones. So Jesus is saying to them, I give you eternal life through the teachings of Jesus Christ. You know, Moses, if I and you were born at the time of Moses, how do we get eternal life? By following Moses. At the time of Abraham, I and you were born, how will we find eternal life by following Abraham. At the time of Jesus, if I was born and you were there, we would follow Jesus, whatever commands. The commands of Jesus are still the same of the Old Testament. He's not stopping you from believing, following the law of the God. Now, when in John 10, 30, Jesus says, I and my father are one, he is saying in purpose. Obviously, as you mentioned, Jews had this, Jews wanted to pick up trouble with Jesus. They were there to make some trouble. So when you want to make trouble, you don't have to go far. You know, you go to the corner and that's enough. So they wanted to trouble Jesus. They said, you are now claiming to be God. You read up to verse 33. If you read verse 34, what was Jesus' response? Jesus said to the Jews, is it not written in your law that you all are gods? The blame they were putting on him that you are God. He said, you are also God. And as I said earlier, in the Bible, God does not mean God. Lord does not mean Lord. Son of God does not mean Son of God. Son of man does not mean Son of man. Because these are metaphorical terms. When Jesus calls you God, what does that mean? Are you God? Were the Jews God? No. What he meant was, in the Greek terminology, the small G-O-D is used. Not capital G-O-D, which is the Father, the God, according to the Bible. A small G-O-D is used for Jesus and for the others. Why? In the Greek language, it means prophet of God, messengers of God, those who follow the commandments of God. That is the meaning of it. And when Jesus says, I and my father are one, right? When Jesus says, I and my father are one, if a Christian is still insists, no, no, that means Jesus and God is one, like one in a, you know, as a person. Gospel of John chapter 17, verse 21. Jesus says to other people, we all are one. So now it's not a three in one God, it's a dozen in one God. Because Jesus is saying, Gospel of John chapter 17, verse 21, I read it for you, that they all may be one as you, I are in me and I in you, that may also may be one in us. Who are these? All the disciples of Jesus. Jesus is saying to the people and referring to God and he's saying, let all of us become one, the same one that is used in 1 John 10, 30. Furthermore, Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 23, I in them, they in me, and that they may be perfect in one. All have become one. Now, this is not three in one God. This is a dozen in one. Who, who all are included in that disciples? It is Peter, it is Thomas, it is Judas, the traitors, they're all included in one. Interestingly, Bible even calls Satan as God. Jesus says, refers to Satan as God of the world. The word God in the Bible, if you read the English translation, this is exactly the trouble. You go back to the Greek, there are two titles. Hothios, God the Father. Tontheos, small g-o-d, which means prophet of God. Jesus was prophet of God, servant of God. Everywhere where you read in the Bible, son of God, it simply means servant of God. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would like to use the time. <laughs> Just one more minute, you know. As, as, the, as, the, as the esteemed doctor mentioned that, you know, um, Jesus is son of God. And this is something where the Christians say, well, see, Jesus is the son of God. That is why he is something more than others. Now, again, interestingly, if you read through the Bible, there are sons in tons in the Bible. 
throughout the Bible that children of Israel are referred as sons of God in book of Hosea chapter number 1 verse number 10, book of Romans chapter number 9 verse number 26, book of Psalms chapter number 68 verse number 5, orphans are referred as children of, as son of God. In book of Psalms chapter number 89 verse number 26 and 27, David is referred as son of God. In gospel of Luke chapter number 3 verse number 38, Adam is referred as son of God. In book of Exodus chapter number 4 verse number 22, it's further mentioned in first Chronicles chapter number 22 verse number 10. In book of Deuteronomy chapter number 32 verse number 6. In second Corinthians chapter number 6 verse number 18. In all these different places, Bible says Adam is son of God, David is son of God, Solomon is son of God, sons of God married the daughters of God, judges and jurists are God, are sons of God, children of Israel are sons of God, Israel, Jacob, he is the firstborn. In book of Jeremiah chapter number 31 verse number 9 it says Ephraim is yes. son of God. The Bible is filled with sons of God. All I would like to say is, when you are reading the Bible, you are reading according to the accusation that the Jews blamed Jesus with. Read the Bible in its original text, and that is what God sent Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to remind, to explain, to clarify to the people. You were calling God as Abba in Jewish language, Abba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced, replaced that Ab in the first verse of the Quran, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ab, you were making a mental picture of that God and having a son with him, a begotten son, a partner, an associate to God. God changed it to Rabb, the creator of all that exists. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. M. Shanahid, and my question is to Dr. Peter Barnes. So, Dr., you are a PhD doctor, I'm a PhD doctor, so hopefully we have, are on the same mental level to, you know, take your answer. And uh, while all night here, just looking at you, most of the questions you answers, or even to the, uh, the speech, it was not, uh, a lot of references were not given. It was your perspective. But the question I wanna ask is actually, I need a reference for that. I do not want your perspective, okay? So, uh, I just need, uh, Following up the same question where the brother asked, Brother Wasim, I'm asking the same question to you. In Bible, Old Testament is full where, you know, God say, worship me, okay? Quran is full of those verses where God say, worship me, okay? Could you please give me an equivocal verse of Jesus, peace be upon him, where he said, I am God, worship me. Just equivocal verses of Jesus, peace be upon him, with reference, not your perspective. Thank you. Okay, let me read. This is Matthew chapter 2. This is the birth of the Messiah, uh, where the, the kings of the Magi come from the east. And Matthew 2 verse 2 says... Uh, where is he has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And, and uh, so in verse 11, uh, they go into the house, they fell down and they worshipped him. Now Mary's there, Joseph's there, and they, they worship the baby, which is an extraordinary thing to do. So that's <coughs> at the beginning of Matthew's gospel. After the resurrection in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus has risen from the dead. And in verse 9, Jesus met them and he, these disciples and he said, Greetings, and they came up and they took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And in verse 17, there's, there's still a fair bit of confusion uh, because verse 17 says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So they're trying to work this out. Uh, but he is worshipped there in, in Matthew 2 and in uh, Matthew 28. When you go to the Gospel of John, for example, there's a man born blind and Jesus heals this man. At the beginning, this man is not a, a believer. Uh, he doesn't know who Jesus is and so when he's healed, they says, he says, well, whether he's a sinner, I don't know, but I know once I was blind and now I can see. That's about all I know. Jesus meets him uh, later and he's been uh, turfed out of the synagogue. Uh, and so Jesus heard that they'd cast him out and having heard him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now he's not saying, do you believe 
that I'm a human being. He's, he's going back to Daniel 7. So there's references for you. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Do you believe I am the son of man in that sense? It would make no sense at all to say, do you believe that I, who am standing in front of you, is a, uh, am a human being like you are? And, and this man says, yes, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? So this man is not so, someone who jumped to conclusions. Uh, I'll believe in the son of man if I see him. Who is he? And Jesus said, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He's saying, I am the son of man, from Daniel chapter 7, I am the king in God's kingdom. And when the man realises that, this man born blind, he said, Lord, he calls him Lord, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus doesn't say, this is the silliest thing you ever did in your life, buster, get up. No, he doesn't say that. He accepts it. So he is worshipped. He is worshipped as the son of man who's the king in God's kingdom. So there's the references, a whole host of them. If you go to John chapter 20, uh, again after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples. And some people think the disciples were all weak in the head. Now, you tell them any sort of miracle story and they believe it. They're quite the opposite. They're really hard-nosed characters. And they, they weren't given to wishful thinking. Uh, and so they came to believe Jesus has risen from the dead because of the hard evidence. They had no choice but to believe that he'd risen from the dead. Thomas is not there the, at the first appearance. And then he, Thomas famously says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I'll never believe. Unless I see that the man who was crucified has now risen from the dead and I could see and touch. And eight days later, Jesus appears to them. He says, peace be to you. And he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. That's the English translation. You want a more literal Greek translation, he says, the Lord of me and the God of me. And Jesus pronounces the blessing on that. He, he says, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, so I hope there there's a, enough references for you, or at least to get started. Uh, Jesus is worshipped. He's, he's not simply revered. Uh, the whole of the Old Testament is pointing to him. I'm, I'm, I'm reading from Luke 24 uh, and verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, so this is the Old Testament, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And, and he says later, these, verses 44 and 45, still Luke 24, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That was what I was pressing upon you to do. Jesus is the Christ. You believe that. All of you who profess to be as Muslims or profess to be Christians, you believe that. What does it mean to be the Christ? Go and test. Go to the Old Testament. Go to, go to Psalm 2. Go to Daniel 9. Go to what Jesus says in, in uh, Matthew 22, where he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. He's David's son and David's Lord. And Adonai, it, it's the Lord Yahweh says to Adonai, Adonai is a title of God, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is before the New Testament, uh, it's Kyrios to Kyrios, uh, the Lord to the Lord. Adonai is, is something that clearly in the context there in Psalm 110 is not saying, uh, God Yahweh says to sorry, someone Doctor, this Sorry, Doctor, if you can just please summarise. Uh, sorry, okay. <laughs> I thought, I, I was short the first time. <laughs> Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, he's not saying, I think this is a wonderful human being here. Uh, how can David's son be David's Lord? That baffled them. 
Thank you. Yep. Next uh, question from the sister there. Um, yes. So my question is regarding the Trinity, which I've also heard compared to water in that water has three forms, ice, um, vapor, and liquid. But um, regarding John 1, specifically 1 through 17, what is your take on that in regards to Jesus' role as part of the Trinity? So that was verses 1 to 17? Yes. Thank you. The sisters asked the question in regards to Trinity, which is the concept generally uh, believed by the most of the majority of the Christian churches, which is more or less a Nicene creed, which started from 324-25 AD uh, in the Council of Nicaea. So the question is in regards to Trinity and as she raised in Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 17, where it talks about the word becoming flesh. So what are my thoughts on that? Point number one, the word Trinity does not exist in the Bible. The most important concept, the very purpose, the very reason for Jesus coming onto earth, in the entire Old Testament, nobody believed in Trinity. If you would have attended any of the lectures of Moses, peace be upon him, or David, or Solomon, or any of these interesting discussions of that time, of any of the prophets, none of them ever spoke of a concept of Trinity ever. They were all talking about Echad, the God is only one. There is no three in one concept in the Old Testament. Coming to the New Testament, the closest verse that came to the concept of Trinity was from first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, which reads, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This was the verse that came closest to the concept of Trinity. This is the King James Version, the first English version that I'm holding, which has this verse, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. In the revised standard version, which was revised by 32 eminent scholars of Christianity, backed by 50 denominations of Christian churches, they removed this verse from the Bible, calling it a corruption in the word of God. They have come a step closer to the Islamic belief that God is only one. Further, in regards to Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 17, as the sister has asked, that the word becoming flesh. This is another idea or the concept within the Christian church where people say, see, in the beginning was the word, the word became flesh. That is the word of God that became flesh, that is Jesus, peace be upon him. Now, from an Islamic perspective, we have no problem. What it means, word, the word of God, the command of God, kun fayakun, God says to happen, it happens. How was I born? Yes, there is a procedure, there is a human procedure that we look at it. You know, the parents, they have this, the, the, um, the medical process that happens for a person to be born. But from God, if you do the same procedure 100 times, the child will not be born every time. It is only one out of 100 times or 1,000 times that a child is born. Why? Because God at that time says, be. Lahukun fayakun. Then it happens. So the word of God is the command of God. God commands, so a child is born. God commanded Jesus be born, he was born. Maryam alayhi salam, Mother Mary in the Quran, when the angel came to her and said, you are going to deliver a baby, a child. She said, how can it be happening when no man has ever touched me? She asked the technical, technicality of it. She said, how can I have a child? The angel said, for God, it is easy. He says, kun fayakun. He gives the command. He gives the word and it happens. How Jesus' command for birth came from God, my birth also came from the same God's word the command, even Dr. Peter's birth came from the same God's word and command. Even you, my dear sister, your birth came from the same God's word and command. Every person is born after the word and the command of God. We all become flesh by the word and command of God. Secondly, word of God. What is Bible? Is the word of God. Is this the fourth God in the, in the unity of God? This is Bible, the word of God. Is this the fourth person in the unity of God? No, no Christian would argue that. They'll say, no, no, no. This is the word of God, verbatim word of God, but it's not God. It's not the fourth person in God, no. So you claiming that Jesus becoming flesh is some form of Godmanship, then I present to you again the same matter as Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 59, where it says that the similitude of Jesus in the sight of God is just like that of Adam. 
God commanded the word, the command of God happened, and Adam was created. The God's command and word happened, and Jesus was created. Jesus was born. And the God's command and word happened, and I and you, we were all born in that sense. Hope that answers the question. So I'll just quickly mention two points. Um, um, Dr. Peter raised the matter of crucifixion, that you know, Jesus was put on the cross and he died there for the sins and the salvation. And then one brother asked a very important question, what is Jesus doing? Believe me, Jesus was, did not do anything before and he's not doing anything even now. He was never given the power or authority to run the universe. He was a prophet of God. What is Adam doing? What is Abraham doing? What is Moses doing? That's what even Jesus is doing. All the prophets of God, they came to the world to do that job, to invite me and you to the worship of one God. Jesus, peace be upon him, himself teaches how to worship. Jesus fall on his face, and worshipped God. How Muslims we do? We fall on our face and we worship God. That is exactly how Jesus fall on his face according to the Bible and worshipped God. Similarly, Jesus called God by what name? Interesting. You will not hear many of the Christians generally don't call God by that name. They keep calling God Yahweh. But Jesus never called God Yahweh in the entire New Testament. But when he was put on the cross, according to Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, 27, verse number 46, and Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 34, on the cross, Jesus cried, Ella, Ella, Lama, Sabakhtani. Hebrew and Arabic, sister languages. In, in Arabic, it will be, Allah, Allah, Lama, Taraktani. Oh Allah, oh Allah, oh my God, oh my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is calling to God as Allah, and according to Reverend Schofield's commentary of the Bible, he says here, the Ella, Ella, Lama, Sabakhtani in Hebrew is A-L-A-H. Very close to the Arabic uh, name of the God, Allah, which is again according to Encyclopedia Britannica, the Jews and the Christians of Arabia before the coming of Prophet Muhammad used to refer to God very comfortably as Allah. So I invite once again to the worship of same one God, Allah, that Jesus called when he was on the cross, when he was in the most difficult times, and in Gospel of John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus says, worship only one God, that is the Father. He says, do not worship me. He has not put himself to be worshipped. And every single place where you read, worship Jesus, or somebody fall on his feet, the Greek word used is... Sorry, brother. Um, just summarize, please. Finish it off. The Greek word that is used there for worship in the Bible, in the New Testament, is poroskonio, which means to kiss the feet. The Jews used to do very comfortably to the kings and the rabbis. So the disciples of Jesus did the same. They kissed, and in English you translate it as worship, but in Greek it is proskonio, which means to kiss the feet. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Peter. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. That, um, if Jesus is to die for our sins, um, then that means that I can go and rob, I can go and steal and anything, and then after that all my sins will be forgiven. And also, it's mentioned in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 20 to 21, that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all of his sins, all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my st statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Let me answer the first question here, two questions there, and I'll simply set out the framework for the Christian view of salvation. I've got Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 to 10, uh, and this is, the, this is the framework that you'll find all through Scripture. For by grace you have been saved. A grace is God's free gift. It's not something we earn, it's, it's something God gives. Uh, it's God's work, it's not ours. The first thing we need to rec recognise in salvation is we can't save ourselves. But God has acted in grace. By grace you've been saved through faith. So those who have faith are those who have received that salvation. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Because the Bible addresses us all as sinners. We don't have all committed the same sins, but the Bible dresses all as sinners. Now, you then, sorry, the lady asked a question about, well, can I go out and rob and do everything? No, Jesus is not just saviour, he's Lord, he's Lord and saviour. 
And verse 10 follows. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before, beforehand that we should walk in them. So they, they, let, me, let me quote the past, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and, and I'll read verses 9 to 11. And this will answer your question, I think. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, but such were some of you. That's what you were like. But such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, so, so grace leads to works. It, it doesn't lead away from God, away from holiness. It leads to holiness. So uh, yeah, that's the framework. Thank you. Next question, please ask the question. Yeah, so in honor of Dr. Ahmed Dida, um, brilliant guy, so in his memory. Um, so I just want to pose this question to you. When you are cherry picking verses from the Bible, it seems like your own argument makes you lose. For example, the last thing that you said is, Jesus on the cross cried out, Eloi, Eloi. If Jesus is on the cross, you've already defeated your own argument because you claim that he never died because you used Hebrews. Um, when you used Acts chapter 13, verse 30 today to start, the, to start your debate, you said that is a conclusion that Jesus is a servant, but that goes on to say that the servant was killed. Um, so I, my main question to you is about the resurrection Easter was there. If you're going to use Dr. Ahmed Dida's arguments about the sign of Jonah, I believe Jonah died, and the, the one on the room where the disciples were, where, disciples were there and Jesus came, um, the assumption that Mr. Didad makes is that nobody, the disciples there did not witness him on the cross, but they did. Um, John, who writes that event, talks about it, and it's a locked room. So I feel there's a lot of assumptions in there, and I feel that when you're cherry-picking verses from the Bible, you are not affirming its full authority. You're only highlighting one sentence. Even the one you use, John chapter 5, verse 30, where uh, Jesus talks about the authority, it goes on to say that he existed before the world with God. So why don't you use the totality of the Bible, and why do you use arguments that support your view when the other ones defeat yours? Thank you. Thanks for the question. The brother has given a, a pretty much a small talk, so I have to respond to that. Hopefully, I can get five minutes. <laughs> Let's start with that. The first thing the brother mentioned that he is, you know, a big fan of Dr. Ahmad Didat. So he's passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him, you know, highest levels of Jannah for all the hard work and eff efforts that he've put in his life. And, you know, I, I myself um, am somebody who has gone into this field of comparative religion and interfaith dialogues through his work and my own teacher and mentor, Brother Imran. So we owe a lot to Dr. Ahmad Didat for all his efforts and work. So may Allah bless him and increase his position in Jannah. Coming to your question, in regards to Jesus being put on the cross, as I mentioned from Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, where Jesus cried, Eli, 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 Lama Sabachthani. And then I said that on the, according to the book of Hebrews, Jesus did not die, which is again from the part of the Bible. I am not contradicting that. My point is Jesus was put on the cross, but he did not die. If I am having an accident and I become, you know, injured, does not mean I died. He was put on the cross. They wanted to kill him. They stabbed him. They did whatever they could. But this is the miracle of God. This is the victory of God that God saved him in spite of all of that. And this is very clearly relevant in two verses of the Bible. First, as you just mentioned, do not use the argument of Ahmad Didat. But interestingly, what happens is while knowing the argument, nobody answers it. And you mentioned that why am I quoting only John 5.30 and not 31, 32, 33 or other verses of the Bible? Why am I cherry picking? If you want me to read the whole Bible, I'm happy to sit down and read the whole Bible. But we only have a limited time, so I have to pick certain portions. The, we have the other guest speaker in order to respond to that. I am yet to hear a response for where did Jesus say, I am God or worship me? That is not mentioned in any Bible of the world. The challenge remains open. It's for the last 40 years. From the time of Ahmad Didat till today. Coming to the sign of Jonah, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38 to 40. Jesus says, this adulterous generation asks me for a sign and the only sign that, and the only sign 
that will be given to them is the sign of Jonah as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. So shall the son of man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And you already know the answer that Jesus did not fulfill this prophecy of three days and three nights. Now the counter question to that is when Jesus came back after three days, all when he was put on the cross, was there any eyewitness who witnessed Jesus dying? All the disciples of Jesus fled away. None of them were there. Nobody witnessed it. They thought on the cross, when you put a man, you stab him, you trouble him, you pin him, you think he died. He's in coma. He's tired. They put his body in the tomb and when they, he comes out of it from within three days, he goes to meet his disciples. As mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, he goes into the upper room and when his disciples see him, they are astonished. They think this is a spirit. So Jesus says, no, come and touch me. I've got bones and flesh and his spirits don't have bones and flesh. Trying to tell them I'm alive, I never died. Where did Jesus die? And at the end then Jesus tells them, bring me some food because I am hungry. After death, I and you will be hungry. If you did not eat for three days, you will be very hungry. That is exactly the proof from the Bible that Jesus did not die. Book of Hebrews, we go back to it again. Jesus prayed to God to save him from death and God listened to his prayer. He was put on the cross, but he did not die. I conclude with the verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayah number 157, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Neither did they kill him, nor did they murder him by crucifixion. They put him on the cross, but he did not die. And this is the confusion amongst the Christian churches till this date. Hope that answers the question. Sir, you have and your <laughs> my name is Imran, and I'm a salesman by profession. And also my question for Peter Burns. And we follow the terminology called KISS, which means keep it simple, short and simple. <laughs> so I want only reply from you is yes or no, because lack, lack of time. When you said in a QA and a that the difference between us, all of us here, and the Jesus is Jesus is not a sinful, and we are sin. We are having a sin, right? So, if someone saying that you are a dog and bring them and kill in front of me, slay in front of me, is that a sin or not? Nah? I can repeat the verses from the Bible just to make sure that these verses are from the Bible, and Jesus is commanding that. Sorry, it's not Jesus. Jesus, it's, it's Matthew 15, mm. I assume you're referring to, the Syrophoenician woman, where he calls her a dog. Yep, Jesus said. I think you're mixing up two things. He doesn't say, bring her to me and slay her. No, no, I'm just giving two examples. Uh, okay. So just, what, what is the question, brother? Is, is calling someone a dog yeah. a Ever. sin? A woman comes and asks her to heal this, uh, his daughter, and then he responds back that uh, she's, because she's not from the tribe where he came to correct the people, which is children of Israel. Yep. Then he says that, he first com his companions comes and says yeah. that, you are not from the same tribe, so he cannot cure. And then, then the, the same companion says that, then Jesus responds her, I cannot throw my bread to a dog, which yep. means it's a sin. Because calling someone a dog who is asking, for help, in my sight, is a sin. So what do you think? Is it a sin or not? Yes me, or no? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then we can't go further. Every, everything, everything's got a context, <laughs> brother. Uh, and look at it. In, in Matthew 15, Jesus goes to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, so he goes to a Gentile area. So the, the, she, this woman's not a Jew. And a Canaanite woman from a region came out and she was crying, have mercy upon me, O Lord. She calls him Lord, son of David, which, which is a messianic title. The, the Messiah is the son of David. So he calls, she calls him Lord, she calls him son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a, a demon. Now, the, the calling in of the Gentiles <coughs> is, is, a, is a real issue. Yes. Uh, as a Gentile, you know, you tend to think, oh, well, you know, God calls in the Gentiles. But back in there, in the first century, Jesus is a Jew. All of the early Christians are Jews. Jesus comes to the ancient people of God, which are the Jews. And the calling into the Gentiles, that caused some disruption in the early church. 
And Jesus doesn't answer a word. So the first thing is, he doesn't respond at all, which is discouraging. You talk to someone, they don't answer you, walk away. But she uh, stays, the disciples came and begged him and said, send her away, she's crying out after us. And he said, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, this, this, no word is discouraging. Now this word is even more discouraging. I haven't come to help the Gentiles. But she came and she knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You know, the, the Jews are the people of God, the chosen people. You're a Gentile. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Now, he doesn't say that very often. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, and he says it twice. He says it to the Roman centurion in Matthew 8, and he says it to this woman here in Matthew 15. Both of them Gentiles. Great is your faith, be it done to you as you desire. Now he's testing her. There can often be a, an outward form that seems harsh when the inward motive is loving. Jesus is actually bringing her into God's kingdom and she has humbled herself before him and he blesses her and he does it in a harsh way and he, he does that in a harsh way, what a, a outwardly harsh way to many people. So, sister? Um, Wasim, I'm hoping if you can just say yes or no to this question. Does the Muslim faith believe that only Allah can forgive sins? and give someone eternal life. Okay, so I just wanted to ask, or I just want to ask about this verse where Jesus said, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up and take up your mat. In Luke 23, 43, Jesus said, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. Sure. Thank you for the question. You have asked, does in Islam, do we believe that anybody else can forgive sins other than Allah, the Almighty God? No. But God gives information to the prophets to forgive people in his time. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave the glad tidings of guaranteed uh, paradise to at least 10 of his companions, as we call Ashra Mubashra. Prophet Muhammad said, all your sins have been forgiven. You have been promised the paradise. Exactly how Jesus said to some of his people at his time that all your sins have been forgiven. You have promised paradise. It is exactly the criteria of a prophet. When God informs them, Jesus does not have knowledge of everything. God informs Jesus because he's a prophet of God. He's communicating with God from time to time. And every prophet does that. At the time of Moses, Moses did that. At the time of David, David did that. They spoke to God and told people, this is wrong. If you do this, you will go to hellfire. At least to one or two people, they said, if you keep continuing this, you will enter into the hellfire. If God informed them that this particular person, John, he has been forgiven, they will tell them, I forgive you because God has already informed them. And as, as I said, the wordings in the Bible, what happens here is, at the time of Jesus, nothing was written down. Whatever Jesus said, not a single word, not even a dot was written at the time of Jesus until he walked on the planet earth. There was nothing. After his ascension, people started to write in his name. Even the first gospel, the gospel of Matthew that has been said to be the first one written is from 70 Christian era, which is almost close to 40 years after Jesus, peace be upon him. That too, there is not one author. There are people, philosophers, writers, fishermen, tax collectors, they are all writing. According to what they think their interpretation is, that too after 20, 30, 40 to 100 years later, I would say these are words of people, not revelations of God. That is why you see you have to keep changing the Bible from years to years. There is a Bible with 66 books. There is a Bible with 73 books. There is a Bible with 78 books and 87 and 99. I say, why are there different Bibles? If there was one God, if there was Jesus who came as a God man, he spoke once, then all should be equal, the same Bible. The Bibles keep changing from time to time. And that is the reason we invite, we assure people that how the Old Testament had to had an upgradation to New Testament, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the final testament as the final upgradation from New Testament because of these discrepancies. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> to conclude for tonight's evening, each speaker will give a two-minute conclusion. 
um, and then that'll be the evening, inshallah. Dr. P uh, Peter Barnes, if you would like to start. I'm reading from Mark, uh, from Matthew 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven is, is breaking in. It's not an expression used in the Old Testament. It's the kingdom of Israel. But this is the kingdom of heaven has come. The king of that kingdom has come to earth. What is the right response? Jesus says the only response is to repent and to believe the gospel. What is the gospel? Now, this, is, this summarizes a lot, but the, the gospel is Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He, he, Christ died for our sins. That's the gospel. And he rose again the third day for our sins. It's based on what actually took place. If Jesus didn't die on the cross, he's a deceiver. And the disciples are deceivers. They're crooks. There's no way you'd say, go to this, this, this will confirm what's true. <laughs> you, these are the worst men on earth, not the best. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king has come. Repent and believe in him. And that's how we get into the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom that down through the ages has been unfolded there's 66 books there's only 66 books there's a fair few translations there's no doctrine that changes this even the worst translated bible will tell you this that it's all there and it's prophesied that's uh, i've spent more time in the old testament it's there in psalm 2 it's there in daniel 9 it's there in psalm 110 the king that's coming is more than more than us he's over and above us the lord who is the king and the savior <laughs> yes brother wasim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin was salatu was salam ala rasulihi al karim wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli i'll make two important points before we conclude point number 1 if jesus died on the cross for taking away the sins of the people and that was what one of the young kids asked the question mashallah jesus says in gospel of matthew chapter number 5 verse number 20 again red letters he says Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, none of you shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus did not say, if you believe in my blood, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Instead, we see it is Paul who later said, if there is no death of Christ on the cross, then there is no Christianity. It is Paul who invented it. Jesus, as long as he was on the planet Earth, he walked before his ascension, he never made such a claim. Instead, the Bible is explicit that if you want to go to paradise, keep the commandments. Jesus says, if people comes and says, what good thing shall I do to enter eternal life? Jesus says, keep the commandments. The system, the ideology, the religion, the faith, the, all the prophets that taught, including Jesus, peace be upon him, throughout the entirety of Bible, it is that you need to obey the commands of God. And Jesus said in Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 23, keep worshipping the, only the Father, the God, the Creator, not him, not anybody else. Towards the end, the second point that I would like to just raise is that Jesus mentioned, and I have mentioned this verse right from the beginning through the day that Jesus said in Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 30, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of the Creator, the Father who sent me. He goes further in verse number 31 and he says, if you hear the witness of mine, my witness is not true but take the witness of the God, the Father who has sent me. So it is completely clarifying that Jesus is not God-man which was the subject of discussion today and I'm very happy I'm very satisfied that our, my co-speaker, Dr. Reverend, P, uh, Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes agrees that Jesus is servant of God. I would like to conclude from the verse of the Quran, from Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Ayah number 51, which is a quotation of Jesus, peace be upon him, recorded in the Quran and the last and the final testament, where he said, Inna Allaha Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'buduhu. And I invite our Dr. Reverend Peter Barnes to come towards the obedience and the fellowship 
of Jesus, peace be upon him, where he said, Verily, the Almighty God, Allah, is he my Lord and your Lord. So worship him alone. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alam. Before I conclude, I would like to call up uh, Brother Wasim to give a gift to Reverend Dr. Dr. Peter Barnes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Now, thank you very much. No, no, no. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Very well. thank you. I would like to first and foremost thank Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes for coming all the way from Sydney. I would also like to thank all the non-Muslim attendees for attending this event. I would like to thank the volunteers for pulling a great event and thank you for the Darabin and Arts Centre. Now, Iria, we, we have uh, a regular street dawah stall in the CBD every Sunday. If anyone wants to join, please SMS your number, on the, uh, the, your name and number, and I'll read it out to you, which is 0430-438-758. That's 0430-438-758. We will also be having a Quran stall on the 5th of May, which is on a Sunday at... Burke Street Mall, opposite of David Jones, from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. You are all encouraged to join us, insha'Allah. All, de all details are on the projector. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide everyone who has attended this event and have a safe trip home. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>